This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to worship at Central Baptist Church on what was at least a rainy Sunday morning in the spring. I'm glad each of you has chosen to spend this hour with us as we continue a worship series in the book of 1 Peter. This is week two of four when our messages will be focused on texts from that book of the Bible. And each week we're asking the same question. How can we be faithful Christians in an increasingly non-Christian culture? What will distinguish us and set us apart most effectively? And today our answer is that we must be willing to suffer indignity without retaliation and even to be seen as weak in a culture that celebrates strength as we follow Christ together. If you're a guest of ours this morning, let me extend a special welcome to you and ask you to do one thing for us uh, while you're here. I hope you'll take a welcome to Central Card from the pew rack in front of you. Take just one minute to fill it out with basic information about yourself and then drop that completed card in the offering plate as it comes by you later in our worship service. We really would love to have a record of your presence today so that we have a chance to welcome you just a bit more personally later this week. We gather for worship at Central every week because we believe, or at least I believe, that the shared experience of God in worship in this place and in this hour set apart for this specific purpose has the power to change us. So my prayer for you and my prayer for me today is as it is every week that God might use these next few minutes to change our lives. As we continue to worship together, I invite you to join me in worship by reading our call to worship responsively. You'll find it printed in your worship guide. <clears throat> we gather together to worship the God of our fathers and mothers, the God of Abraham and Sarah, of Miriam and Moses. The God invites us to leave our selfish ways behind, take up our cross, and discover what it means for ordinary people to live extraordinary lives. This is our great God. Let us worship together.
Please join me in the litany from Psalm 105. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in his strength. See his face always. Remember the wonders he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he pronounced. You his servants, the descendants of Abraham, his chosen ones, the children of Jacob. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the promise he made for a thousand generations. He brought out his people with rejoicing, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. like to invite the boys and girls to join me in the front. Good morning. How are you all this morning? Good. Good. All right, I would like for you to raise your hand if you've ever said the words, that's not fair. Uh-huh. Good, good. Uh, <laughs> now keep your hands raised if after you said those words, you started acting kind of ugly to try and get your way. Make it fair. <laughs> I'm glad some of y'all are pretty honest about that. Me too. I'm raising my hand too, okay? Yeah, sometimes you've done that before. All right, well today I have with me a picture of one of my heroes. You may have heard of him before. His name is Martin Luther King Jr. Have you ever heard of him? Yeah. yeah. So Martin Luther King Jr. stood up for something that he believed in. And most importantly, he stood up for what he believed in with love. He tried real hard to do it in a peaceful manner and to act a lot like we know Jesus does, right? So he tried really hard. I'm not saying he's perfect. I'm saying he tried really hard and he did a really good job of it. And he, the sad part is that often, as he was standing up for what he truly believed in, people treated him badly in return. So he's trying to stand up for something really good, which we know was that he wanted equal rights for African Americans. And he was working really hard in a peaceful manner to do that. And some people did not like that he was doing that and treated him badly for it. Yeah, he did go to jail sometimes. So... There are people who were very angry at this, and he continued to do it because he truly, truly believed in what he believed in. He thought that everybody should be treated equal. It didn't matter what your skin looked like. It didn't matter if you were a boy or a girl. It didn't matter if you had curly or straight hair. Everybody is treated the same way because we're all children of God, right? And he believed that. So when I started reading 1 Peter, the letter that we are reading in worship today, it made me think of Martin Luther King because this is what Peter says in that letter. He writes that we should keep doing what is right even if it's really hard. So I'm going to give you an example that you might know about. You ready? Have you ever been at school and you've been in line and somebody comes and breaks in front of you? Has that ever happened to you? Yes. Somebody comes and breaks in front of you? Okay. Yes. And I bet you said, that's not fair, right? Or... Uh, hey, excuse me, teacher, he broke in front of me, she broke in front of me, and you're just working real hard to make this situation fair, right, or to make it right. So, do you think that you should continue to do that and be upset and maybe even start calling names and cry and scream, or do you think maybe you just let it go? 
just be peaceful. Because it isn't right that they broke in front of you. That's not fair. That isn't right. But, but you really just can't do anything about that. And it's not really that big of a deal to get all worked up about it. So you just peace, peacefully just say, okay, fine. You can have the, the spot in front of me, right? So that's the best way. That's how Jesus would do it, right? Oh, you can't, they can't get in front of you because you're the lawn leader? Mm. Okay. So sometimes acting with love can be the hardest thing we ever have to do. Acting with love might mean letting somebody get in front of you in line even though they broke in front of you. It might mean not calling anybody a name or doing something bad to somebody just because you felt like you've been wronged. Okay. So we try to act with love and be peaceful. Let's pray. Loving God, help us to love one another the way that you love us. Help us to see ways to act with love and kindness in everything we do. Amen. Our scripture passages this morning come from... The prophet Isaiah, chapter 53, the suffering servant, and then we hear the words of Jesus describing how the suffering servant acts in real time. Hear this word from God for us today. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then from Matthew, you have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek as well. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, the hardest thing you ask of us is that we love our enemies. We know how we'd like to love them. We'd love our enemies to be far away. We'd love them to not compromise our security. We'd love them to not scare us or change the way we live. We'd love them to be lovable. Lord, we'd love it if loving our enemies was the popular thing to do. We'd love it if the news stations would provide examples of how to love instead of fueling the spread of hate. But then, Lord, if loving our enemies was easy, 
Jesus wouldn't have told us about the tax collectors and Gentiles who love only their friends. If loving enemies were easy, we wouldn't need God's strong arms to bear us up in difficult times. We wouldn't need the blood of Christ to save us from human sin. We wouldn't need the Spirit flowing among us, wiping our tears. We wouldn't need the Bible to tell us what the world does not. God of all mercy, who loves us even when we are sinful enemies, who saves us through your immeasurable grace, who gave us a gift we did not deserve, let us imitate you by loving those who are hardest to love. Teach us your ways, O Lord. And when the world meets our congregation, I pray that through our words and acts of kindness, they will know that you, the God of love, lives among us. We pray this in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, in this world where great blessings but also great burdens abound, help our eyes to be open to both the miracles and the tragedies all around us. Keep us mindful that we are your body here. Help us to see the needs of others, move our feet to go to them, and our hands to comfort, heal, and to give. 
Use our voices to proclaim your goodness and grace. And for blessed Jesus' sake, who paid it all for us, move our hearts to pay our portions. In his name we pray. Amen. As we try to understand each move he makes But when the path grows dim And our questions have no answers Turn to him Bow the knee 
Trust the heart of your father when the answer goes beyond what you can see. Bow the knee, lift your eyes toward heaven and believe the one who holds eternity. When you don't understand the purpose of his plan in the presence of your king, bow the knee. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, Blair. Thank you, choir. Thank you, everyone who's led us so far in worship this morning. When you trip walking down the sidewalk, I've never done this before, but some of you maybe. <laughs> when you trip walking down the side, when you just kind of take a bad step and stumbled just a little bit, what's the very first thing you do? You, you look back, right, to see if anybody saw you, right? It's like a reflex or an, or an instinct, isn't it? 
Just as you start to take that first full step to try to regain your balance, just as you're doing that, you turn and look over your shoulder. Did anybody see me do that? Is it somebody I know? I sure hope not, right? (laughs) The human mind, the human psyche is we are highly attuned to how others perceive us. So even a small misstep, a literal misstep or even a figurative one when noticed by others, can potentially be a source of great embarrassment for us. David Boyd Sr. passed away about eight months ago now, his family sitting over here. He was a member of this church and a well-known artist and cartoonist. He might have been most well-known for doing lots of artwork for Jeff Foxworthy, and specifically lots of artwork for Jeff Foxworthy's You Might Be a Redneck franchise. So Jeff Foxworthy was here for Mr. Boyd's funeral, and I knew he was going to be here. I saw him before the service. Our sanctuary was was packed, I mean, really packed out for the funeral, and Mr. Foxworthy was sitting against the back wall right there in the center of the annex. And I knew as I was getting ready to speak that morning that I was planning to say a few things, tell a few stories from the pulpit that I hoped might get a little chuckle out of the audience, maybe at least register a smile on people's faces, maybe even get a real laugh. But you never know exactly how people will respond to this story or that anecdote, especially in the context of something like a funeral service. So I got up to speak at Mr. Boyd's funeral and I started telling my little stories. And one of the stories, I I honestly really can't even remember what it was anymore. It really got a great response from a full congregation here in our sanctuary. I mean, it got a really big laugh. And in what I can only describe as the single greatest display of self-control I have ever demonstrated in my whole life... (laughs) I didn't so much as glance over at Mr. Foxworthy to see if he was laughing too. I wanted to. Everything inside of me wanted to pause and turn and stare and see if he was even just a little bit amused at my joke. Right? If you're ever wondering what, what holy thoughts are going through your pastor's head as I'm yammering on up here, it's usually something like that. That I didn't even dart my eyes over there, not even for a millisecond. I just stuck my eyes firmly on that back wall and kept on with what I was saying. We're highly attuned to how others perceive us. <laughs> We're constantly on the lookout for signs of affirmation or encouragement or recognition from those around us. In the ancient kingdom of Persia, The Persian king had a close circle of advisors, and within that close circle of advisors, one advisor rose up to be favored more than all the rest. So the king issued a royal decree that everyone should bow in deference to this most favored advisor in recognition that the king had placed so much trust in the wisdom and judgment of this one man. That advisor's name was Haman, and from that day forward, everyone that Haman met in the capital city of Susa bowed at their meeting of him, everyone except one man named Mordecai. Who knows why Mordecai refused to bow? Maybe he didn't hear the royal decree right away. Maybe he didn't recognize Haman as he was passing him on the street. Maybe he just thought the whole thing was ridiculous. Anyway, day after day, Mordecai and Haman would meet or or pass by one another in their comings and goings around the palace. And day after day, Mordecai would be the one person in the entire kingdom who refused to be properly deferential. And this just really got under Haman's skin and increasingly so as time went on until one day Haman couldn't take it anymore. He was so incensed by Mordecai's behavior that he went to the king asking for permission not only to kill Mordecai, but to kill every Jew in the entire kingdom of Persia in response for Mordecai's failure to be sufficiently obedient. In the end, it's Mordecai who disrupts Haman's plan, but Mordecai isn't satisfied with just disrupting the plan. He carries out his own revenge, killing everyone in the entire kingdom who had originally agreed to go along with Haman's plan. More than 75,000 of them, Scripture tells us. All killed 
because one man refused to bow to another man, and neither of them were willing to let go of the slight. We're highly attuned to status and to pecking order. We want people to be appropriately deferential, don't we? A little later in the Persian period, in the Bible, a man named Nehemiah was sent out from that same capital city, Susa, in Persia, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, which had lain in ruins since the Babylonian exile for nearly a hundred years. Nehemiah is sent out, and he's about to complete his job in Jerusalem, but just as he is close to finishing, he faced such intense opposition to his project that he feared the project would fail. Now, Nehemiah was a close servant to the king. He had been appointed by the king. He had been sent specifically with the king's orders, supplied by the king, given every resource he might need to complete his task by the most powerful man in the world. So you might wonder what could have possibly gotten in his way as he was trying to finish his project. Was it an invading army or a natural disaster or an act of God? No. The biggest threat to Nehemiah's wall wasn't an invading horde. It was the rumor mill, an organized and coordinated whisper campaign inside the kingdom. A few well-placed and well-connected people started spreading rumors. You know, they would say, a lot of people are saying, and I hear even more people agreeing with them, the campaign continued that Nehemiah's motives aren't as pure as you might think they are. And rumors started circulating, filled with half truths and innuendo, designed specifically to discourage and discredit Nehemiah, and it came this close to stopping him right in his track. <laughs> We're highly attuned to our place within the group. <laughs> Aren't we? Are we in with the in crowd? Do the powerful people like us? What's the most popular opinion of the day and how can we get on the right side of it? We're so attuned, in fact, that sometimes whisper campaigns can be more effective than military ones. <laughs> You can't tell, by the way, we've been studying the Persian period in the Old Testament and Wednesday night Bible study for the last 10 weeks. <laughs> We're continuing today in our study of 1 Peter, a letter that starts out telling us it's written to God's elect, the exiles, Christians scattered throughout Asia Minor in a decidedly non-Christian world. And we're asking the question, how do we live as faithful Christians in a world that is both increasingly indifferent to and ignorant of our history and the content of our faith? What can we do to set ourselves apart in an increasingly secular culture? And our message text today comes from 1 Peter chapter 2. You'll find it printed on the back of your worship guide. I encourage you to follow along, listen as I read that text for us aloud. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called... Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins and his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer 
of your souls. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example of his suffering that you should follow it. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. (laughs) When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself wholly to God and to God's justice. To suffer in dignity without retaliation is to be like Christ. When we return anger for anger, or injury for injury, slight for slight, insult for insult, we stray from the example of Christ. This is a simple and incontrovertible, oft-repeated truth of Scripture. We've read from Isaiah this morning, which tells us who the Messiah will be. We've read from Matthew this morning words from the Messiah himself, and we've just read together from 1 Peter words that tell us who the Messiah was. And the message is clear. The willingness to forego retaliation in response to indignities large and small, even when retaliation would seem to be clearly justified, That willingness to forego retaliation is central to the character of Christ. It is a big part of who Jesus is, whose example we are called to follow. I want to say that one more time. The willingness to forego retaliation, even when it would seem to be clearly justified, is central to the character of Christ. And to this we have been called to follow Christ's example. In slights and injuries, big and small, we're called to turn the other cheek, to go the extra mile, to give even more than is asked of us, to suffer even unto death. No matter the insult, no matter the injury, no matter the slight. But won't people think we're weak? Comes the question from the congregation. Won't they think we're weak if we don't respond in kind, if we don't project strength, if our anger doesn't match theirs? They'll just run all over us. Won't we find ourselves sliding in the pecking order if we don't return slight for slight? If we don't find calculated ways to participate in today's rumor mill... Tomorrow's whisper campaign might be about us. These are the concerns of people who are constantly looking over their shoulder to see who might be watching or glancing around the room in search of affirmation. (laughs) But it is precisely our willingness to appear weak which will distinguish us today. According to LifeWay Research, only one in four Americans report attending church at least twice a month. That means that generously this morning as we sit here in our pews, four out of five Americans are doing something else today. (laughs) 250 or 260 million Americans won't be in church today. We're living in an increasingly non-Christian world. And among people who increasingly don't know the history or the values or the traditions of our faith or even the basic message of Christ. First Peter was written, though, when scholars estimate that there were only 10,000 Christians in the entire world. They really were like exiles, like strangers in a foreign land, just scattered few and far between. 
none of the cultural attributes that prop us up today. So what made them so successful? What set them apart in such a distinct way that people became attracted both to them and to their faith and to their God? They were willing to be seen as weak in the eyes of men so that they might be judged as strong in the eyes of God as they followed the example of Christ together. This, more than anything else, will distinguish us. In a culture increasingly obsessed with getting even, and obsessed with retaliation, and obsessed with the escalating impulse to appear strong by returning slight for slight, but when we look over our shoulders, or glance around the room, It should be because we're wondering if God has seen us. (laughs) Because we're wondering if God is pleased. And what is pleasing to God is different from what might seem to advance our cause in the eyes of men. We set ourselves apart most clearly and point others to who Christ is most effectively by our willingness to forego retaliation to extend grace, and just to keep on going when faced with slights and injuries, large and small, as we follow the example of Christ together. Join me in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we are gathered this morning seeking to be people who follow more closely your example day by day. Use our presence here and our time together to lead us toward just that. As we seek to follow your example of suffering, even suffering unjustly. As we seek to follow your example of being willing to appear weak, to extend grace. That the world might know your Father and ours together. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. We don't end services at Central without giving you a chance to respond to what God might be doing in your life or in your heart. Lots of ways you might respond this morning, but there's two ways you might respond publicly. Uh, This is a time when you might decide to join Central Baptist Church to say, this is where I want myself and my family to be planted. We want to be part of what God is doing here in this church and in this community. Or today might even be the day when you publicly profess your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior for the very first time. If you'd make either of those decisions this morning, I'd invite you to make them publicly by meeting me at the front of our sanctuary as we sing our hymn of response together. You'll find those words printed in your worship guide. you be seated for just one minute, please? Peyton, come and stand next to me. This is Peyton Bass. Lots of you know Peyton and his family. Peyton and I had a great conversation this morning about Peyton's decision to declare publicly today that Jesus Christ is his Lord and Savior. Uh, Peyton comes this morning as a candidate for baptism. If you would join me in welcoming Peyton and join me in rejoicing in his decision this morning, would you let that be known, please, by saying amen. Peyton, we're going to schedule a Sunday when you can be baptized here as part of a worship service very soon. I invite Peyton's family to come. Ben, Christy, Christian, y'all, y'all, y'all come on up and stand with Peyton. 
I'll ask them all to stay right here so that you can come and shake Peyton's hand at the end of our worship service this morning. Uh, lots of our women got back from a women's retreat toward the end of last week back safely. Thank you, Katie, for leading and organizing that effort. We've got a rest service here in our sanctuary. Rest midweek prayer and communion service here at 6 p.m. 30 minutes in the middle of the week just to pause and sit still and be in God's presence and in one another's presence together. Those services always end with the Lord's Supper. David Kinraid will be playing music for us as we do that this Wednesday night. Thank you all for being present in worship this morning. I hope every last one of us leaves this hour of worship encouraged and emboldened uh, to be faithful representatives, not just of this church, but of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stand with me, please, as Steve comes to lead us in our benediction. This weekend has reminded us that God's sun shines, God, God's rain falls on the good and the bad, the righteous and the unrighteous. Suffering is not God's judgment on us. If we live long enough, we all will suffer. So follow Christ's example and suffer well. Never looking back over your shoulder, but keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus, our suffering servant, the author and perfecter of our faith. Amen.